It was late afternoon. It would soon be dusk. I don't think I ever told you the one with Captain Hopewell in it, the man named Kurt was saying. Don't start. For God's sake, you'll jinx us for sure, the man named Merle said. Just, just get me thinking about that one and you'll jinx us. This one isn't going to jinx us. If, if you knew the story, you'd know that, Kurt said. And then for a few minutes, both men sat silently and mulled over everything they discussed on the nature of luck over the course of the last few months as they'd wandered up and down Superior Street, shaking cups for spare change, scraping for odd jobs, whatever it took to gather enough for some booze and a scratch lottery ticket. They'd agreed that to talk too much about good fortune just before you scratched would decrease the odds of it coming because luck had to bend around the place and time of the scratch. <laughs> Establishing itself in relation to your state of mind at that particular moment. You either scratched in a deliberately calm, quiet moment or in one of great emotional intensity. Scratch a ticket on the sidewalk in front of the Hope Mission, or worse yet, inside the lounge with all that dusty grief, no chance in hell. At your mother's grave on a pristine winter day, after praying your prayerful respects and laying some flowers against the tombstone, about 50-50. Out in Lake Superior, on the deck of a good ship under a gloriously crystalline sky, 60-40. On the deck of the same ship, in a hundred-year storm, with slush ice forming on the lake, just after hearing the news that your old man died, 90-10. <laughs> Back at your mother's grave in the fall at dusk, having survived that hundred year storm, sure thing. Best to clear the head of all expectation and settle into a state of not caring as you looked out with silent and blissful longing at the lake. You haven't heard this one, so it's not going to hurt our chances if I tell it, Kurt was saying, leaning back on the bench. It won't change the odds any more than if I were to start talking about that dream of having, uh, that I have of buying a decommissioned ship, either here or down in Cleveland, dry dock the fucker, put in a jacuzzi and a pool table and a wet bar, all that stuff, he said. And then the older man, who sat formally with his hands on his knees, reached up and adjusted the lapels of his coat. He just planted a seed in my mind about you buying that retired ship, which is just as much of a jinx as me thinking it. <laughs> so you're saying I shouldn't talk, Kurt said. The lake in front of them was unusually calm for this time of year, a burnished gleam that stretched out to a single vessel far out heading into the horizon. Behind them to the right, the bridge sat with its hundred ton counterweights up and the span down, waiting stubbornly to be relieved of its burden. With the exception of the ship out in the water, nothing seemed to move. As we discussed ad infinitum, you should hold off on talking too much about fortune, good or bad, until we scratch that fucking ticket, Merle said, shaking his head, hands in his sleeves, and twisting his cufflinks into position. He had a long, gaunt face and still periwinkle eyes. Well, Captain Hopewell was a hopeless asshole, Kurt said. Can I at least fucking say that? <laughs> ships in Vietnam. Vietnam and ships. That's all the kids got, Merle thought. I didn't, whatever you say, professor. I, I didn't say a word, Merle said. But you were thinking something, and I know what it was, Kurt said. He stood and walked down to the shore to examine for the second time that afternoon the dead flies and grime that marked where the water, no tide, nothing even resembling a tide, had receded during the hot, dry summer. The ship had disappeared over the horizon, heading on what seemed to be an upbound tact that would pass to the south of Split Rock Lighthouse and Isle Royal, then charting a course to the Sioux Locks, likely the Poe Locks, Kurt thought. Yeah, yeah, the Poe. It's the only one that could handle a boat that length. Down through Lake Huron, down the St. Clair, past Detroit, across Lake Erie, up the Welland Canal, across Lake Ontario through the St. Lawrence Seaway, 400 slogging miles, and then out to sea. 
It was easy to imagine the urgency that would fill the ship this time of year as it shoved through the locks, searching out the sudden serenity of the seaway with the land close on both sides and then leaving it behind, entering the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and finally, the open Atlantic. That's how it worked. You boarded in the spring, hung, hung from the sides and painted the hull, scrubbed the deck and worked your ass off bolting and unbolting hatches, hardly paying the water much notice until one day as you stood on the deck having a smoke, the vastness of the open sea flashed you like a girl with her skirt blown up, exposing a beautiful secret and then you fell back into the boredom, the tedium of the hatches, the decks, the dust in the holds. It opened and shut on you, the sea did. Oh well, you busted my ass, Kurt shouted. You were a vintage Nova Scotia stoic. Again, I have to say, I've heard everything I want to hear about Hopewell, Merle said, studying his friend. Kurt was real thin, dressed in an old flannel shirt and a canvas jacket that hung loosely from his wide shoulders. All the drugs he'd taken had given him a saintly gauntliness as if he'd starved himself for some grand purpose and his eyes, when he wasn't squinting, had a shifty dart that somehow made him look younger than his 52 years. Come on, just tell me a little bit, just a word or two to confirm that you know the story. Kurt said, slapping his sides and hopping, lifting off his toes. I, I think we agreed that it's okay if it's a new version that has some good luck in it. Well, if you insist, Merle said, you told me you were working on an old scrap heap. Do for the heap, you said. It was flying a Portuguese flag and had a captain named Hopewell. And then you asked me for another word, another word for hard ass, and I suggested that you use the word stoic. You said, yeah, stoic, that's the right word. You called Hopewell a vintage Nova Scotia stoic, like you did a minute ago, and then you told me the story. I could have told you a hundred fucking Hopewell stories. I have a bunch of them, Kurt said, and stoic's a word that I knew before you taught it to me. Vietnam was in it, Merle said. I'd say that half my stories have Nam in them. That doesn't prove to me you've heard this one. Well, it had Captain Hopewell in it, and it had Nam in it, and it had a ship that was due for the scrap. Did it have a guy named Billy T? My buddy who enlisted with me in Benton Harbor? Did we not agree that we'd refrain from telling stories that might in some way involve luck? Did we not agree at some point, Merle said, pounding his walking stick into the dust? Look, just humor me give and confirm that you've heard it and I'll shut up. But if you haven't heard it, then I think I should talk because I feel like talking. And you know, if I don't talk when I want to talk, there's a possibility that the tension from me not talking might jinx us just as much as me telling some kind of story that has the wrong type of luck in it. <laughs> was there a guy named Billy T? If Billy T was in there, you heard the story before. In which case, I'll let it go. Merle reached up, pinched the dimple in his tie, curled his palms over the end of his stick, and shaking violently, tried to stand. Jesus, kid, don't blame me if this scratch is worthless. I have my own desires to talk, but I have the wisdom to hold my tongue. <laughs> he gave up the effort, sitting again, and watched as Kurt took a chug of beer, wiped his mouth, lit a cigarette, scruffed his feet as he prepared to tell the story, working it over in his mind, presumably, trying to remember if he had indeed told Merle the entire thing from beginning to end, or if he'd just given the abbreviated version with the end left out. And then it goes on. Woo!